Freightwave Sonar puts you in command. truck it i know i am that is our good buddy mike lombard trucker personal trainer raconteur uh renaissance man napoleon lover he just ran the austin marathon he had a zin in his lip he completed the thing and he got a nice gong ring in there congratulations buddy hey we have an awesome show today but before we get to our guests i have to talk about something i have to address something there's a story that the the national media, the corporate media, the MSM has just blown up. They turned a very small clip from one truck driver into this sort of national movement that's not really even happening. Now, let me preface this by saying I'm not anti-Trump. I'm not pro-Biden. Uh, I'm just addressing this to the listeners of this show who have freight moving and they want to know, is this actually true? Are people getting involved with this? In fact, I actually thought those, those Trump shoes that he released, the $400 ones, were actually pretty sick. If anyone's got an extra pair, I think I could pull those off. Send me them Trump shoes and I'll wear them to mats. But let's get into this because Saturday I saw a tweet from the leading report and it read like this. Breaking, truckers are reportedly in talks to refused delivering loads in New York City beginning on Monday in solidarity with former President Donald Trump in the wake of the $350 million fraud ruling against him. Look, this immediately stuck out to me because I, I work in freight and I'm like, truck drivers are talking, like where are truck drivers talking? We're, we're like the most fragmented industry in the world. Is there some central truck stop where they all go to Iowa I-80 and start discussing this? No. In fact, I had actually seen the clip that they were talking about and I thought maybe there was more to it, but in fact, there really isn't. First of all, here's a clip that started all. It is from Chicago Ray, who's a Twitter user. He has over 200,000 followers. Let's roll a little piece of this clip. Hey folks, your old pal Chicago Ray. Uh, I've been on the radio talking, talking to drivers for about the last hour, hour 15 minutes. And uh, I'm talking of at least 10 drivers going the other way. I'm heading down from South Wisconsin. And uh, they're going to start refusing loads in New York City starting on Monday. All right? So that's what that's all he said. He said, hey, I talked to a couple of drivers. Ten guys said they're refusing loads <laughs> on Monday because of this boycott on the ruling. That is what the mainstream media ran with. That is Chicago Ray. He doesn't run New York. He's a local driver. You can see that truck there. It's a day cab. You know, he's not in a semi. He's not an 18-wheeler running freight to New York. I don't know if his other drivers were or not, but this immediately spun into this. Look at all these headlines. The mainstream media ran insane with this. They go, uh, News Nation, truckers boycott New York City after Trump's 355 $5 million dollar fraud ruling. The Washington Times, trunk backed truckers boycott New York City deliveries after civil fraud ruling. Daily Mail, it could shut down New York City. Female trucker joined boycott to protest Trump verdicts as consumers will pay the price when they stop delivering. Rolling Stone, Trump endorses trucker campaign to stop deliveries in New York City in recent fraud ruling. Well, the heat must have come on Chicago Ray because then he tweets, I took that video down from Friday because it went viral and my grandson seen it on TikTok. Here's his tape. Hey folks, your old pal Chicago Ray checking in. Um, uh, just want to let you know, look, I took down that video that I posted on Friday uh, because it went viral, went on TikTok. Not because I don't stand by what I said, because I do. But, you know, my grandson seen it and, you know, he got a little hurt by it and it hurt my feelings. So, you know, what the f you know, that's it. It is what it is. So clearly this got a little bit bigger. Obviously the media spun it way further than what he intended. This guy, and Chicago Ray says himself, he's like, I'm not a leader of this movement. I was just saying on a clip that I overheard 10 drivers say it. This isn't like some highly organized thing. This isn't like the Freedom Convoy or something, at least at this point. I've talked to a lot of different brokers since this happened. I've talked to a lot of different truck drivers. A lot of the truck drivers who don't run New York City to begin with affirm their belief that they will never run New York City. New York City is a pain in the butt. But a 
lot of the brokers I've talked to, they said we're not seeing any canceled loads whatsoever. A lot of the newer companies I deal with, oh, we're not seeing any change whatsoever in the freight flow. So where did this come from? The media just spun it up. But Chicago Ray, he's still perpetuating this a little bit. Here's his example of how this is working. Roll the clip. If you remember yesterday, I was telling you about a guy to refuse a load refrigerated. Load going to New York City. Well, this broker just told me he got 30% more for that load. For that same load that that driver refused yesterday, he got 30% more from the receiver to get that load over there. Refrigerated load. So there you have it. The one load that he knows about <laughs> during this boycott that's not supposed to go to New York still went to New York. Hey, good on the uh, driver broker. They got 30% more. But you also noticed something if you're in freight. What was the original price? 30% more than what? Right? There's so much misinformation that comes in with this thing to spin this into a story because I guess they wanted clicks on headlines when in reality, nothing's really happening here yet. You know, there's a reason a lot of drivers don't call on New York. And it's usually because of stuff like this. That's how this shit is, man. He already done took it up. I'm not finna f my up getting in here, man. Little, little ass road. Excuse my French this morning, but don't send me back to New York. So there you have it. By the way, we'll fix that on demand. Fresh mouth on that gentleman. But you see, it's a pain in the butt to drive in New York. Um, the mainstream media, too, one thing they've been loving doing with this is finding truck drivers who don't run New York to begin with to quote them. Well, I'll quote a truck driver. Here's 212 Trucker. He says, I will continue to deliver freight to New York City, all five boroughs, get out and look around, feel the hustle and bustle of Manhattan. I swear that I love you. Because here's the reality. Look, a lot of company drivers, a lot of, like, who is calling their customers? Think about the reality of this. Who woke up on Monday and said, like, ah, sorry, I can't deliver your road, your load because there was a court ruling against Donald Trump. See you next week. That's just not happening right now. There's too much capacity in the market. Rates are too low. Now, you know what? If they took, like, Trump off the ballot or something, I could see this movement getting a lot bigger. Now, here's something for you. 212 Trucker, you want to go to New York? Maybe you can drive as well as this gentleman right here. Take a look at this blindside back. I mean, New York is on a whole different level of difficulty than anything else we have going. This driver is super impressive. Trucking A says, and the little four-wheeler sneaking in and around. I'm sure four-letter words were said. Reber Capital says, when I worked in trucking, most accidents we saw were not severe, but the hundreds of daily left turn close quarters LCQ incidents seemed to me the solution was simple. Seen in this video, drone launched from a rooftop charging port of the tractor and giving the driver an aerial view. Look at that innovation in the comment section. Not a cat says, those four wheelers made everything more difficult. He handled that very well. Patty says, awesome. I was heading to jury duty one day prior to trucking and saw a driver back into a dock at Kedzie, where it's only two lanes and residential-ish in mere seconds. Now I know it's called Blindside. I gave him a thumbs up when he hit the dock because I was definitely impressed. Barb Shaminsky says, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. New York. Joseph Daniel says, so the New York protest is like me protesting deadlifting 750 pounds. Jim Waters says, I can do that in my wife's, my, I can't do that in my wife's minivan. Jim, I can't do that in my minivan. I can't do that. A little cowbell for that driver. Joseph Dunaway says, Stephen doing work. I guess this is a driver. Uh, if you need this talented driver on a load, pick him up. And Nancy McKenzie says, I can see why so many truckers avoid New York City. It looks like a specialty thing that can only evolve with painful practice. I've stood many a time in New York City and just watched the consummate skill in wrangling the big trucks into ridiculously small spaces. That should be a contest. Hey, so look. I'm not saying this protest is never going to happen. I'm just saying this boycott is having no impact whatsoever that we can see so far in the market. If you're seeing something different, let me know. But for those of you running freight in New York, it seems to be business as usual. Now, moving on, let's tip the band and we'll get into today's show. I want to take a second to thank these guys and put them on your radar, Dynamic Logistics, because I got to say they're doing logistics the right way. Their TMS software is saving shippers a significant amount of time and money. Check them out at dynamiclogistics.com. That's logistics with an X. All right, on today's episode, it is 684 of What the Truck. We got HD Drage and Container Services. Hope Allen, she's shining the light on port volumes, Drage on the East Coast, building a company, the power training. She's got some things to promote. It's going to be a good time. We got Repower's Jake Battles. He shares the in and outs of the trailer market. Battles tells us how his company is turning idle assets into cash. Maybe you can too. We're also going to talk about that, that fight in Albuquerque, that, that fight on the flight. 
industry advisor Jim Conference here too. He's teaching us carrier vetting tips. Tell us why retail is like Jurassic Park. Uh, is it ever okay to scream here? I got a ton of stuff for Jim. Can't wait for him to come up. Maybe we'll even get into maintenance and parking. Plus, we got a $500 parking fine, remote control semi trucks, trucking a house, pickleball barges, and a Somali pirate hunting cruise. Anyone want to sign up? But right now we got Hope Allen, CEO at HD Drainage and Container Services, LC. Hope, it has been way, 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 way too long. Where you been, donor? I've been up here, you know, I've been doing the same thing, but life just moves so fast. Life just moves so quick. Yes, it, tell me about it. <laughs> you tell us about you. So since it's been a while, there's been a ton of new listeners. The show's grown since some people have never been introduced to the wonderful woman that is Hope Allen. Tell us who you are. For sure. So hi, everyone. I'm Hope Allen. I am the CEO and founder of HD Dredge and Container Services and also Logistically Speaking Online. And we are based out of Meta, Georgia. Uh, Duna and I go back uh, from when we started doing container storage services for Georgia Port Authority and CSX Rail. So we've grown tremendously over the last three years since meeting Duna, and that's who I am. Yeah, what is, like, what is HD now? What's the elevator on what you're all doing? What are you getting into? Uh, last time I talked to you, you were talking about so much expansion, so much growth. The market's changed a little bit since then. We've all changed a little bit. Tell me. So HD Dredge actually has taken a knee uh, as of September of 2023. Oh. Uh, we actually experienced a 15% growth. We, we grew 1,500% growth in about uh, eight months. We grew extremely rapidly. Um, and then towards the last quarter there, Q4, uh, we began to experience what most experienced, which is the volumes were dropping tremendously. Um, so right now we've pivoted back to our main hustle and bustle, which is container storage services. Uh, we're getting a lot of hits for depot services um, and uh, empty heavy equipment uh, services that's going on there. But from the dread side, we've kind of taken a knee since Q4. Wow. Interesting. You know, I had a uh, Craig Fuller had an interesting tweet recently. Um, he's been trying to be optimistic about the market. He's been talking about green shoots and everything. And he said, I've heard from multiple CEOs with large transaction portfolios connected to the trucking spot market about how abysmal February has been. One described it as the beginning of the end of the great flush out for small carriers. January was a head fake, said another. Are you seeing that in the market? Was January like looking pretty good? And then February is just like, oh, really? Oh, Again? man. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Those words can't be any more truer uh, for the smaller carriers. It's definitely this market has been brutal to us uh, just trying to recover and maintain with overheads still reflecting, you know, COVID time or, you know, 2022 time uh, for, you know, cash flow and everything. So we're definitely seeing those same feeling those tight restraints there. How are you pivoting? Like you mentioned taking the knee on Dreyage. What are you doing to restructure and look at this market and say, okay, this is the company we have to be to make it to the next point? Yeah, so I'll be transparent. You know, I'm always down the clown, doing it and always yeah. very honest. Um, I had to reassess some mental health here because uh, we were doing everything right and then everything wrong just kind of showed up out of nowhere there. So first we kind of stepped back and took a breather there from the mental health perspective. Uh, but then also we looked into other services that we had probably had shot away from while things were going so well on the dredge side coming out of the ports. Um, which is the container storage side. And we've been getting a lot of hits from uh, people who have up and coming warehouses and construction in that area, uh, needing to hold their items, you know, in storage, um, as well as um, other uh, empty containers and things of that nature. You know, interestingly enough, there is some good news on the horizon, at least. Kyle Taylor, he put this tweet out, and uh, we have a chart here. At least on the ocean side, the cavalry is kind of coming. We're seeing an uptick across all yeah. ports. I don't know if you need to jump back into drayage here, but if you see Savannah's down there, Savannah's the light blue line near the bottom. Now, it's not doing as well as yeah. Port of L.A. or Long Beach, but yeah. it's still growing, and it's looking yeah, a little bit better than it was. But Actually, it's looking kind of the best it has in a while. Yeah, just a little bit. I mean, Savannah Port has been doing phenomenally well, as they've always done. Um, they're number one right now for export freight in the United States. Um, so they're doing extremely well. And then they're, they've boosted uh, the rail activity as well uh, with just how much export 
and import freight is coming in. So, I mean, Savannah is always there. Um, we do have some potential clients on the horizon that are pinging us currently for uh, new start dates starting in April 1, uh, May 1. That's the on, That's been our only challenge, getting those customers to commit to the start dates for us to get back going. Interesting. So, what 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 does 2024 look like from here then for, for a company like yours? So a company like ours, we've been speaking with our uh, financial planners and uh, strategic mentors ourselves on how do we uh, delve down our overheads to meet the current market. Um, we kept our rates up so we could pay our bills and the rates are not saying that now that <laughs> we could pay our bills. Um, so it looks like we're scaling up slowly, uh, basically biting off only what we can chew um, until we can get back into a positive setting. Oh, man. Hey, by the way, I saw a really interesting post from you. There's been such a push, especially like in drayage. I've been talking to yeah. Harbor Trucking Association on the L.A. side so much about EVs and some of them have them and some have fuel cells and some of them have challenge on a almost microcosmic way. You bought yourself a gift. You got yourself an Audi uh, EV that we got a picture of it here. It's got a big bow on it. What was your what was your experience with this car? So I purchased the Audi e-tron back in May of 2023 as a 40th birthday gift to myself. Um, about 30 to 45 days ago, I began experiencing challenging charging issues where the vehicle will only charge up to 65 percent. Uh, the vehicle upon purchase gives me about 238 miles on a full charge. However, now we're at about 180 miles on a full charge. Interesting. And how about how about winter? It's been pretty cold out here. We like this winter oh. out here in the, in the southeast has been kind of brutal. Yeah. So I've been traveling back and forth to Atlanta quite a bit on family business. And when I'm in Atlanta area, I do experience slower charging challenges there. But when I'm in uh, coastal Georgia, which is the Statesboro metro area, um, I don't have any in challenges because the weather is a little bit better. Um, but it does typically take about 12 hours to charge from home with the weather being where it has been. It's about 22 to 26 hours for a full charge. You know, you are I mean, starting. I can't drive my car. <laughs> yeah, that's what's kept me from getting one. Like I got, we got a minivan for the family. We're just running one car right now. Yeah. I put over 12,000 miles in like nine months on sure. the thing. And a lot of our trips are to go see like family in the Northeast yeah. or North Carolina. So we got to go. Like our smallest long trip is like 600 miles. And like EV's just like, yeah, no. I'm not going to so for me to go, kids. Yeah. Yeah, so for me to go to Atlanta and typically in a regular vehicle like my Tahoe, it takes me about three hours and 45 minutes to Atlanta. Uh, but with this Audi, it takes me about six and a half hours because I have to stop and charge twice to oh. be able to get there. Jeez, oh, I'm out on it. It's hey. just a cute car. <laughs> Oh, you got a you got a few cool things coming up though. You're promoting. You've got an international drayage cohort eight week program that's coming up. What's up with that? Absolutely, we're launching our eight week intermodal drayage cohort program. We've been getting hit a lot about learning drayage, the intricate details, and this is for our C suite executives uh, or large or corporations who have drayage providers who may not be as well versed and experienced in the industry. That program launches March 11, 2024. It's eight weeks and you can find more details on Eventbrite or at training at logisticallyspeaking.online. Very, very no hope. Anybody who wants to connect with you, they want to, they want to help. Maybe they want to take a trip in that Audi uh, thing and help you charge it. Where do I send them to? How do they hook up with you? Oh, you can find me on uh, LinkedIn at Hope Allen or Logistically Speaking Online um, on LinkedIn or on IG at Logistically Speaking Online or IG HD Dredge. Well, here's to a good year. I know you're a fighter. I know you and your team are going to figure I'm it out. You know, some great <laughs> courses and you're going to change. You're going to train that C-suite. Thank you so much for coming on today. You're very welcome. Thank you so much, Duna. Have a great day. You too. Take care. All right, everybody. Meanwhile, take a look at that. Talk about big loads. Talk about rating this trap work. Danish Sardar says, what if I was in there pooping? I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. It looks pretty stable. I mean, he's not rocking that much. Um, Curtis Garrett says, I once saw them do that with a Walmart in Alberta. I don't know about that one, Curtis. Carl Vimaster says, best mobile home I've ever seen. Rob Carpenter, worst case, it falls off and set up is free. Joe Seppi says, the customer is going to be upset when they get that house and it's all wet. So much shade. Yeah, you're going you're gonna to tarp that thing? I do every time my house rains.
Uh, Mark Lowe says, technically, it's a load of lumber. I mean, sorry, Mac Lovin. Hillbilly says, amazing, amazes me a house can be moved like this and not even cracked a window. Pistol, at least have that required red flag dangling out the back, along with a couple of signs, right? And attack dog says, all I can imagine are all the drywall cracks. Well, hey, amazing work, driver. There's plenty of people here. Like, we have these random rotaries in Chattanooga. I thought when I left Massachusetts, I'd be away from rotary life, but we have even more here, and people out here don't know how to use them either. But, like, that that driver sure did. Now, we got someone in the studio. It's Jake Battles, VP, Business Development and Sales at Repower. Come on over here, Jake. He's getting comfortable over in that. By the way, I got. I should warn you, the chair you were sitting in, it has a, a, a shaky leg. So, oh, you didn't fall through. No, I did not. No. Hey, what's up, man? Not much, man. This is uh, pretty wild to see behind the scenes. Yeah, look how dirty my desk is. Back. People don't know this. My desk is like it's a complete just, mess. It's full of swag. I'm digging the Northeastern Motor Freight truck uh, right here. New England Motor Freight. New England. Yeah. Uh, fallen flag. I know. Fallen flag. I grew up in New England, so I would see those trailers all the time, and I have a Checks lot of finium. And if you notice here, too, on this desk, one thing people don't on air know is this doesn't go in it. It's just shelves. Our yes. These go straight into shelves. This is the torture they put me through up here. Right, Christian? That's right. See, Christian agrees with me. Hey, how many milligrams is yours in right now? Six. Six mil. Same here. Same. Same gotta here. Gotta keep it in. You always gotta make sure it doesn't fall out. Yes, that's exactly right. Now, my buddy Mike Lombard, I don't know if you know him online at all. He just ran the Austin Marathon and he, had, he did a full lip. Really? Yeah. Yeah. It's all about the stimulation, man. You gotta keep, gotta gotta, keep sharp. Gotta be careful. I think they're gonna crack down, though. It reminds me of like, like the 1950s when they'd have like cyclists smoke cigarettes and stuff mm -hmm. to like be like, it makes your wind better. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> you don't know until you know. Hey, what's a, by the way, it's really funny. A friend of mine, two dogs and a lady, she's been mentioning you guys a lot. And she just okay. tweeted out, no power only loads going where I need to be. I'm dead heading home. I think I'll be getting another repower team trailer after my home time. I've had enough of this power only BS. That's as good a setup as any. What is the yeah. elevator on repower? Well, the elevator on repower is that it's a digital marketplace where people can exchange equipment, right? Yeah. And so for two dogs and a lady, uh, power only rates are, you know, they're low, just like all the rest of the rates. And so we provided a platform that allows people to connect with asset owners and fleets and basically rent their trailer for 10, 20, 30, sometimes 60 or 90 days to get live loads and to be able to bounce from point to point and uh, improve their experience over the roads. What do drivers like about this? Is it is it a lot of these drivers who are in the power only segment who are like, okay, screw this. And what's wrong with power only? Why why do two dogs and a lady and other drivers having so many problems in that space right now? Well, I think we're seeing a lot of traction with enterprise fleets, 3PLs, as well as the owner operators. And I think the power only challenges are just like anywhere else. If you have somewhere specific that you need to get to and the people you're running power only for, the loads aren't going there, having a trailer on your back gives you some of that flexibility to get where you need to, when you need to be there, especially for home time or relays or other things of that nature. You know, I got to ask you a question. You were at F3 in Chattanooga, right? I was. You met Brad Jacobs, did you not? I did. Did you learn anything good from the man, Brad Jacobs? I think we have a picture of you with him. There we do. I know. Yeah, he was a fascinating guy. His perspective on life and the way that he tackles problems and just looks at and, and the way he processes information, I found fascinating. I actually just got his book and I've been making my way through it. And it's it's really fascinating. His The way he writes is exactly the way he speaks. It's like it's like having a uh, being able to peer into his internal monologue. You know, I was I was I asked him a question at F3 and I was, I was sitting next to some people and someone was like, man, uh, why is he even doing another company? You've only have so many summers left, you know, and the guy's getting close. I think he's close to 70. Right? Yeah. And he's like, you've only got so many summers. Why would you? Just? And I go, because he wouldn't be that guy if he didn't feel compelled to just not stop. No, I agree. I, you know, he said at F3 that he's a one trick pony. It's just a really good trick. And it seems like he has he feels some sort of financial and fiscal responsibility for his shareholders. He's done so well. He has such a track record of executing at a high level. I mean, if I'd have made a bunch of money investing with him, I wouldn't want him to stop either. No, you know, when these guys get really candid with you too, they're like, look, I have mental health issues when <laughs> I stop working. Yes. Like this keeps me occupied. This keeps me busy. I have to keep growing. I have to feel that momentum. I have to keep putting those logs in the fire. It's sort of like people who like are, are so consistent with the gym or anything like that. And it's just amazing to, to see. I got to ask you now though. So it's been a tough freight market. That's no yep. secret to anyone. What does that do to like repower? Does that harm the trailer rental market? Does it help it? What does it tell you? What's really interesting about repower in my background, I came from an asset-based trucking company 
company, 3PL, factoring, fuel cards, even equipment leasing. And the thing about Repower that I find so interesting is that its value exists beneath the bell curve. If the mar- if the freight market is really high and people need trailers, they need they not only need them, but they need them in the right place. So Repower shared asset network really drives value in a top freight market, but also in a low freight market. You're really concerned about asset utilization. You're really concerned about the customers that you do have, making sure they're taken care of. And the universal trailer network that Repower has been building and continues to innovate with has really been able to solve a lot of those issues and has really been able to, you know, push push the envelope for methods of acquiring equipment and using that equipment in the most efficient manner. The most efficient manner. Now, what is like the First of all, I got to imagine this space is very inefficient. There's yes. traditionally there hasn't been a lot of tech. A lot of people don't even know where their assets are. Correct. How do you start finding out where those assets are, start utilizing great power. Like, does it take some sort of like systemic change within an organization? It's not as much of a lift as you might think, right? Um, The biggest benefits with Repower recently and continues to evolve with our telematics integrations, right? Working with fleets that really dive into telematics and being able to integrate with Repower, being able to see where their trailers are idle and where their trailers and customers need them um, is really being able to leverage the relationships that, that the marketplace brings. Right. So, you know where you're short, where you're heavy. I mean, obviously, the Western 11 has been a challenge for a lot of fleets. And so, you know, to um, the quote we called out earlier, you know, power only off the West Coast has just been abysmal. I mean, all rates off the West Coast have been abysmal. And so, you know, you can either look at taking a low paying load from the West Coast with a repower trailer to Phoenix or to Dallas, and then start really kind of getting into the lanes that are generating positive revenue. Otherwise, you're looking at, you know, $1.10, $1.20 running power only. And so we've been really been able to to kind of minimize some of those inefficiencies by making sure that these asset companies trailers are in the right place. Interesting. Now I got to ask you, so how does your system work? Like someone like two dogs, she needs a trailer, Mm -hmm. she's sick of the power only BS. How does that work now? So there's an open marketplace function that allows you to shop for available equipment the same way you would go and look for a rental house on Airbnb, or it really even kind of operates like a load board for trailers, right? You can go and search by location. It pulls up a map with points that you can see, and you can look at different asset types, reefers, vans, flatbeds. And you can also see some of these trailers are available to pick up and deliver in the same location, but some of them are going from west to east or north to south. And you can really kind of find the one that best fits your network or where you want to go. And you pay by the day. You can have it for five days, 10 days, 30. And it really just gives you that flexibility to keep up with the ever-changing needs of the supply chain. Do you anticipate growth? I mean, you're a sales guy, so you're probably right. going to say yes. But do you anticipate growth, like honestly, in this space? Do you think that I, I, this, this year is going to improve at all? Absolutely. I think we're we're seeing a lot of traction with our enterprise fleet customers, our 3PLs, our small carriers. I mean, we've got enterprise fleets renting from enterprise fleets, so they're not having to go on trailer hunts. We're having our owner-operator segment continues to grow and seeing the benefits of having a trailer on their back. We're also being able to see, you know, 3PLs take advantage of pricing tools that we've built out to see, you know, tra- uh, needing access to a trailer should never be a reason you say no to a freight opportunity to service your customer. And so we're continuing to build tools to bring access to these assets as efficiently and seamlessly as possible. And so we do, we do see growth. We had, our January was nuts. I mean, it's been, it's been great. How many trailers do you have in like within your network now? Listed on the platform, I think we're over 1700 as it was today or yesterday, but access to equipment is three, four hundred thousand trailers, depending on, you know, our suppliers and where their needs are. Now, I I don't know if you follow me on social media, but I've Mm -hmm. I've posted some abysmal trailers before, especially in Rate the Strap Work, where the the trailers are literally strapped together. Yes. We have that one with no roof on it. I know. Strapped together. How do you make sure the trailers that are within your network are good? So we utilize, you know, inspections, uh, digital inspections at the at the start of a rental, at the end of a rental, so that the renter is documenting the condition of the trailer. And then that stays with your asset owner in their pla- in their portal system. So if a renter goes and picks up a trailer and it needs issues, they report that to Repower and the asset owner, and we get those issues remedied on the spot. And so, and if that issue cannot be remedied on the spot because of the 
you know, the concentration of our network and the amount of trailers, we can always de- refer them to another location close by to make sure that they're staying moving. We don't want them stuck with, you know, a tandem that won't slide or flat spotted tires. We understand that these drivers, you know, the time is money. And if the wheels aren't turning, they're not making money. And so we do, we're continuing to innovate in even more ways um, to make sure that the the efficiency continues to grow. You seeing any, uh, you know, the t- I started the show talking about the, the boycott in New York. Yes. Have you seen anyone boycott your trailers in New York? No. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, I feel like if you've been in this business, I've been in about 10 years. I feel like every quarter there is a social media backed boycott, whether mm-hmm. it be at the border, whether it be in California, whether it be in New York. And, you know, I understand why, you know, people are struggling right now. The market is tough for people. And, you know, to your point you were speaking about earlier, if you can drive of you know a tractor and a trailer in New York, that is a different skill set. I mean, yeah. that is top tier you know, man and machine put together. It sure is. Well, hey, speaking of man and machine, let's talk about a flight that happened yesterday. One of the guys from Barstool Sports was on this flight out of Albuquerque, New Mexico. Show this tweet right here. It was the wonton Don. He says, 30 (laughs) minutes after departing Albuquerque, I was shaken out of my Panda Express and tequila-induced stupor by a man trying to aggressively open the airplane door four rows back. Me and five other dudes had to wrestle him into the aisle, duct tape his legs, and throw flexi cuffs on him. Just safely landed back in... ABQ, but holy S. Now, let me ask you, if you're on the flight, are you getting up and are you diving into that pig pile? Oh, absolutely. Especially if my family and my daughters are on there, yeah. there is no doubt. Like, it's, if we have to choke him out, we have to choke him out. Do you, do you fantasize about this a little? Like, do you hope this happens on a flight? You know, my wife jokes with me because when we travel, and I'm sure... I'm not going to speak for every man, but I'm always looking at where the nearest exit is, you know, what the escape plan is. I don't know. You know, I think a lot of it is just innate male, you know, just trying to take care of those who you love. But even if I was by myself, like I am way too involved with stuff I probably shouldn't be. Shouldn't be. Yeah, the world's gone crazy. It is. The world's gone mad. The world has gone mad. Oh, here's what he had to say, too. Billy Football says, what the F was wrong with the guy? And then uh, he says, low T, I think. Low key jealous. Did you get to beat the S out of him? He wasn't fighting back too much. Put him in a headlock at first and then just ended up sitting on him. Uh, was he sat in the exit row? Yep. Oh, man. Oh, my God. Intrusive thoughts. What? <laughs> no kidding. I mean, what's that guy going through, too, right? Like, what? at what point do you go, you know what? I'm just going to jump out of this thing. It's not worth it anymore. Yeah. It's uh, it's pretty terrifying. Now, before I let you go, I got to tee you up with something easy here. Because I Shoot. saw you guys visit Covenant, and you brought a bunch of boxes from my yes. favorite pizza place, Pizza Bros. Do you agree? Best pizza in Chicago? I, 100%. I definitely agree. And what was interesting about that is, so I worked at Covenant years ago. Yeah. Great group of people. But one thing that I think doesn't go noticed or not is their shop guys that work on these trailers, right? We're we're trying to help them keep them moving and we're helping the overall, you know, entity of Covenant Transport, but I wanted to make sure that those shop guys were taken care of. And so the two gentlemen came, they came from Covenant's trailer shop up on the hill, came down, took those pizzas to the shops. We want to make sure they got some love. It's changing tires, doing DOTs, making sure that those trailers are safe and ready to hit the road. Well, hey, Jake, thank you so much for coming by What the Truck, stopping by the studio. How do people reach out to you? How do they work with Repower? They can follow us on all our socials. Um, they can reach me at jake at repower.com. You can visit repower, R-E-P-O-W-R.com. Uh, if you have questions, concerns, you can also reach out to support at repower.com. And we're happy to help you talk about use cases, see what we can do together. Yeah, you have to invite me down to your office sometime. Come on. We're right down the road, less than a mile away. Really? Yeah, right, by, right by the convention center. Awesome. Well, yeah. hey, take it easy, Jake. Thank you so much for stopping Absolutely. by. Absolutely. Take Thank care. You. My man. All right, we got to tip the band one more time here. Dynamic Logistics gives you total control of your entire shipping operations. Live location status updates every 15 minutes and the ability to combine multiple orders into a single load, leading to significant savings. Check them out at dynamiclogistics.com. That's logistics with an X. All right, elsewhere. reported that Russian luxury cruise ships are offering pirate hunting cruises to customers. In these cruises, instead of being victims of pirates, people pay around $5,700 per day to sail near Somalia on heavily armed private yachts. They hope to attract the attention of real pirates. When the pirates approach, the armed passengers on these yachts open fire with weapons like grenade launchers, (laughs) machine guns, and rocket launchers. The yachts also come with bodyguards who are said to be a group of former Special Forces soldiers. For an extra $20 per day, passengers can even use an AK-47 with 100 rounds of ammunition. (laughs) Wow, what a a bargain, especially in this market with inflation. Uh, Corby says, the market provides. Man, you guys are sick. Sashi Boo says, dude, sign me up. Thefather.net says, does sound kind of tempting, not going to lie. How much is the charge to hire a Jack Sparrow outfit? Mr. Uh, Oh, yeah, hey, bring that right over here. 
Mr. Uh, Delgado, Mr. Delgado says, uh, what port do these crews embark from? Is this a direct flight from Miami? Hey, thank you very much. Got a repower hat right here. Dad hat, kicking it for the dad right here. Thank you so much, Jake. Uh, Mr. Delgado, but I got some bad news. I got some bad news. This is an old video. It, got, it was getting shared around on X. Snope says, common sense would likely tell us that the idea is absolutely absurd. The last time we checked, killing people is illegal and arming bloodthirsty, inexperienced cruise passengers with high-powered weapons is probably not a, go a good idea. It's also doubtful that John Doe would have much success filing a travel insurance claim after accidentally blowing off his own foot with an M16. Although, Oh, I guess back in the day, Anova and a bunch of other news sites, they just ran with this story anyway. Kind of like the trucker boycott. Not much behind it. They're just like, you know what? That's a good headline. It's the way media works, people. Now think about that too when you see every other story out there, right? It's easy to spot it when it's your own industry. But now think of all the other ones that you don't work in. You're like, oh, wow. And you get all worked up. Maybe the whole story is not there. We're going to get the whole story now, though. From Jim Coffrin, industry advisor. Mr. Jim, how are you today, sir? I'm awesome. Thanks, Nunner. Good to see you, man. What do you think of that pirate hunting cruise? That's wild. Seriously, what went to mind is I'm thinking there's, um, I don't know if you know this, but in, in Texas, one of the largest um, wild game, big game industries on the planet is in Texas. So I'm thinking of all the guys that are hunting hogs from helicopters. They're like, hey, I got a new <laughs> vertical. I'm in. There's phones are dialing right now. I have a true story for you. So the first time I ever went to Gats was in 2019. I think it was actually the last Gats. It was like the one before COVID hit. And these guys picked me up. And the first thing they said to me was, you want to go up in a helicopter and shoot some hogs? You know, like I'm a dude from Boston. We're like, guns are illegal. And I'm like, wait, we can just go and do that? We didn't end up doing it. But um, then I learned, I started researching it. I'm like, oh, this is like, that's like a big sport there. It's like clay pigeon shooting out here. You guys just get up in helicopters and just start bombing down on, on hogs. Yeah, except the only difference is the rounds you got to put in that cannon they're shooting from, they're a little more expensive than your uh, 243 you're shooting from the helicopter. I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. That would cost That would cost a lot. Now, hey, introduce yourself to us for those of you who have never met you before, sir. Hey, first I got to say, Dooner, do you remember last time we actually were face-to-face? -face? Was it in? Was it in Vegas last year? It was in Chicago. It was in the Chicago. Original. Do you remember when JD and I handed you your Texas hat from, brought you your big hat from Texas? That's oh. the last time I was in the room with you. Okay, yeah, that, that, I still have that hat. It's amazing. It came with a, a hat box and everything that you could carry around. Uh, they do nice work out there in, in Texas making those hats. And yeah, that Chicago event was great. That was the Blizzard one. Yes. So, um, yeah, hey, I'm Jim Coffrin. Um, I... To be honest with you, I've, I've never been the face of many organizations in the industry, but uh, I've been in transportation, logistics, trucks f for 40 years. I was My first job was sweeping floors out of high school. Uh, I built trucks for about 18 years in the bodybuilder side, engineering, you know, rocket science, motion control, advanced technologies into uh, commercial applications. And then I, I worked in Lean and Six Sigma and process control and started managing fleets back in the early 2000s. I worked with the ABC Supplies of the World, and um, I was an engineer type by trade, so a lot of my fingerprints are in the industry. Um, I worked with the people nets and Trimbles of the World. I was a consultant. I built the MPG Guarantee Program. I uh, work with guys like Brian Mulshine, who created the connected vehicle platform and the concept. Uh, I was sitting in the on in the room drawing out the whiteboard. How do we create this connected IoT? Create something of value. Then I started uh, fixing fleets, and so I worked with uh, you know Hirschbach Motor Lines, helped them to re-engineer uh, how we looked at costs and equipment and. Uh, I was also a specialist, so I integrated um, all the major systems, telematics, the functional software, what do they do? So I help configure and optimize, and I also design systems uh, along the way. Um, I really, you know, work in the area of BI and big data. And now this convergence is, um, you see this amalgam of all this stuff, technology, information, mountains of data. And um, there's a couple of challenges. Um, you folks certainly know it with your 
data and analytics platform. Um, you got a mountain of data, you got to be able to handle it. So how do you design servers and systems and processes to build these integrated frameworks, the things that Microsoft and Google have been talking about doing? Um, I have development partners that live out there and they work with their engineers. So we basically, if you are giving an analysis, I want to build a Bugatti of a supercar. And so we take all the pieces and parts together and we layer the engines and the powertrains and then we engineer tools and systems. And then we often build the perfect kind of software to manage something. So I've been working on 20, 30 years of building what I call Lego blocks of different executional software, different analytical tools, big data techniques, and we're converging those into what we call um, kind of the super highway of information throughout the entire supply chain. But it's not just simply analytics. It's not the what did I get? Why did I get it? Uh, we're now using techniques that the artificial intelligence is trying to go after. And we're taking a totally different approach rather than trying to say, give me trillions of data points, give me seven trillion dollars of ai chips and i can go solve the world um we've learned to take knowing the industry and how business trucking supply chain participants actually operate mm -hmm. and their interdependencies and we take a different approach and we can do what our our, our claim is we will out oracle oracle um we will before they can even stand up 10 more supercomputers, um, we've demonstrated in three weeks that we can build the answers to what the, the machine learning and the AI is trying to provide. We can do that from the inside up and we can do that um, in frameworks that we've stood up and proved in 90 days. Um, we can transform businesses that you know, never made a million dollars in their life to twenty million dollars. Jim, a Jim let, year me stop you. In... let me stop you really quick. Do you have, do you have an example? Like, sure. let's make those to make this less abstract. Do you have an example sure. of doing that? Like, you don't have to name the company, but what was like? What's like like a like a brief case study? Like, what did you do for this company? Sure. Um, I used to work with you know from the Creek Carriers to the Old Dominions to the Hirschbox, and um, you know a, a small fleet was one hundred seventy five trucks. And we're sitting in a, the old TCA benchmarking program. And in less than three years, we're making $2 million a month. So how do we scale the efficiencies? How do we scale the margin? How do we improve how we manage the business? So these frameworks, I always, uh, I chuckle and kind of kid, you know, the broker guys, you know, no cheap freight. I, I get it and I believe it. But you also don't understand that operationally underneath the hood, the best operators on the planet actually have a competitive advantage. They manage the business differently and they scale. Um, uh, you know, the small company down in Southern Alabama uh, started out with 10 trucks. They grew it to about 150 trucks in 2008 when the sky was falling and everything was, you know, falling in around us. They grew. They doubled the fleet in the same year. Today, you know, they're over a billion dollar entity with thousands of assets and they're buying and buying and, and assimilating uh, acquisitions into their system. But the way they're doing that is they're using these layered frameworks to understand how to run the business better. Uh, I've worked with the largest telematics guys Um I was a, you know, an advisor to Orcom, for example, and they have millions of units, right? Hatbag Lloyd is putting millions of devices on network. The challenge is those millions of devices can produce billions and trillions of data points. So how do you, what are you trying to do? I'm not trying to buy messages. I'm trying to buy understanding. What do I need to do differently? And so those are the things that we do, and I help technology companies or tr transportation supply chain companies to understand how do you leverage the data and make the right investment, but also, you know, I have a concept called tech gacity. And um, where that comes from is having bought and deployed many, many 
millions of dollars worth of technology and solutions. I used to run around the country and when I was speaking, I would ask the owner, raise your finger and point to one solution that says, I know for a fact that it changed my life. I know exactly how and why and what it did for me. And most often everyone in the room shakes their head and says, I think it helped. Yeah. Um, or we've got, you know, a hundred thousand dollar license for a piece of software that sat on the shelf and was never configured. And we tried it six times and it didn't work. So what I do is learn how to deconstruct. What is the software trying to do? What's it really trying to manage? How do I build closed loop understanding that I guarantee the ROI because I designed it in a way that I know the result that I got and I know for a fact what I got and what I would have gotten. And so I learned to consult and help technology companies look at their product and say, why isn't it scaling? Why isn't it adopting? How do I build a product today? And maybe it helps a small carrier, but how do I scale it to work with the largest transportation supply chain companies in North America? Jim, so Jim, let, let's I talk figured about out how to Jim, build a modular house. Go ahead. Very cool. Just in the interest of time, we got to move on to carrier vetting because it's an issue you, you approached me with. I thought it was really interesting, and this this feeds right into tech. There's a, a, at least a dozen like carrier vetting companies right now. I feel like a new one reaches out to me every week and says, "Hey, we're doing carrier vetting. We have this new tech program." And you gave a little pushback on some of the tech behind that. What's your thoughts on carrier vetting and the software? Functionally, absolutely doing some great stuff. I mean, I love what, look at what Hi Go Highway has done. Look at what Sanders, uh, Cassandra's done. Look, so functionally, they do what they do. They do a very good job. Here's, here's one of the problems. Um, and I use a number of anecdotal stories, but le let me give an example. I can put technology on a system. I can track a trailer. I can track the reefer unit. I can track the geofence. I know it went into a cold storage facility. And then all this Internet of stuff says, hey, I can tell you something about the carrier, the operator, its performance rating, but it's a myopic view. It's it's that individual carrier. And we want to vet down to that granularity, their safety rating and the risk associated, the nuclear verdict possibility. So it's a very important subject. But I go back to an analogy that I used back in 2000 when the emission standards were changing and everybody ran around and said, I want to tell you how clean my exhaust is. And I have literature that says, this is how great it is. And I, and I use the analogy that we're looking at the individual carrier and th they're worthy of having an opportunity and they should run a great business and make a living doing trucking. The problem though, is we're looking at the warts and we're looking at why there's, warts and say, we don't care. I just can vet you. Yes or no. And the problem is when we looked at, for example, a more global systemic thing like the emissions and the engine platforms, what happened was, I don't know if people know this, we, we had seven mile per gallon fleets in 2000. And then when we brought the technologies in, we literally took over a mile per gallon haircut across the whole industry. So we burned 20, 25%, 30% more fuel under the idea of we're going to clean up the emissions and carbon and all this stuff. But what we did is we induced unintentionally consequences because we didn't tackle the right problem. Mm. When we got through the emissions and the engines and had a strategy in 2013, 14, we started engineering performance engineering and we collaboratively worked with the engine groups and the transmission guys and the wheel end guys. And we worked with the routing guys and we worked with Trimble's mobility and optimization platform. And I was sending data out to Navistar and Freightliner. And all of a sudden we were engineering performance in the whole system. And my fear is, while we're looking at the vetting, what we're not doing is helping those small carriers really understand how they fit into the system and how do we approach this from a holistic standpoint. And, and so it's like brokerage. Brokerage has a great functionality in the business, but it started from a lie. 
and it, it we perpetuate a lie every day. I and I put you know bears all the time, but you know what is the number one lie in the industry? I got a truck, right? The whole brokerage business, the spot market, is built around the idea that I got a truck. I lied to you. Now I'm going to go find a truck and I'll lie to you until I got a truck. And now I'm not lying to you and I'm providing a value added service. So what I do is I look to say, how do I connect you and how do I get you to understand in operational context what the opportunity is and how do I make you better along the way? So I'm not simply saying reject the guys. They're great. They're, they want to grow their business. They want, look at what, um, you know, a lot of the independent operator kind of a back end dispatch management trucking company as a service. It's awesome. What's enabling that is the ability to move information, educate, bring them in so that they have the context of what really the competitive advantage biggest operators on the planet really do. And so I always speak to, you don't really understand how they really do it. And, and that's what I do is I study the how and I study the possibility. And then I've learned techniques for, you know, it's like we joke about the truck or we joke about the, the chasing the pirates. There's a, in every joke, one of my isms, I have these isms, just libraries of them is margarita salt is my friend. And what that means is if we get past the offensive, if we get past the pushing everybody away, because I've got a secret sauce under the covers that nobody knows. And we start to take a, a little bit of margarita salt and say, let's extract the truth and, and the essence of what we're trying to solve and work together. And then all of a sudden we emerge with these very profound different paradigms and we can actually build an interconnected supply chain and stakeholders that understand functionally, how do I fit into this mix? Um, and so that's what I do is I study how it works and why it works. And then what do we need to do to move information and put it in the face of the right people at the right time? Um, I've, I've heard, heard of, this anecdotally. Go ahead. I've heard of a few, like just anecdotally on, on my end, or I've heard from smaller carriers who've been hit by some of these programs, uh, one that you actually mentioned, because they didn't have enough inspections. And there's a lot of smaller drivers who don't understand that. They've, they've been driving around trying to, you know, not necessarily avoid inspections, but they're not going out of their way to get inspections. And now like the new training to them is, well, you got to go and get X inspections or else you're not going to satisfy this person SAS program that now gave you an F. And, and that's a challenge. Um, you know, I, my maintenance specialty is probably where I spent most of my time, but I've spent a lifetime going under the covers where nobody else knows how to get there and figure out how to clean it, configure it, fix it. And, um, you know, as you look at other areas in the business, the same thing. But again, with the small operator and you say they're at a disadvantage, the reality is, is that because they don't have the volume, they don't have the inspections. In one example, uh, our buddy, um, Mr. Dawson out at Accident Plan. So he has recognized a phenomenon and a trend. People don't realize that, remember when all the storms came in and all the insurance companies backed out of the insurance industry? And so now everybody that lives on the water, our federal government put an insurance pool together. And so we're underwriting all of the hurricane damage and the storms because all the insurers walked out and said, I don't understand why I'm losing money and my underwriting standards don't work. So now you fast forward and you look at the trucking industry. You don't realize this, but the insurance industry is asking themselves, should I stay in the business? Should I underwrite the industry? And what they're challenged with is, Everyone has perspective from their own view and their own risk tolerance, but they also have their own information. What no one has done, and this is what I'm doing, is sitting in the middle of the industry and saying, I want to make you down to the individual driver and truck safer, more productive. You don't, because you're more efficient, you don't have to run. You don't have to run illegal. When I was with the people nets and the uh, of the world, and I was fixing carriers, I helped fleets transition to e-logs. Now, here was the result. We had fleets that were doing 6,000 miles a month per truck. 
And then we say, oh, well, if you could just simply, remember Schneider used to advertise, I'll get you 2,500 miles a week. Well, when you look at the optimization and you look at the information, we got trucks going 13,000 miles a month legally with ever going over their logs because we looked at it as a holistic approach. So again, we're seeing that same thing in the insurance industry. We're seeing that in all kinds of regulatory impacts to the small operators. And I'm saying that we can help collaboratively solve the problem a different way. But what do we do in the meantime? We beat the bad guys over the head. They're not bad people. Yeah. Next topic. And this one, this one, I'm, it's going to be kind of a lightning question, right? I'm going to bring something up. This yeah. went up. This is, this has gone viral on freight Twitter. Show this right here. This has gone viral on freight Twitter. And it says $500 fee will be charged for parking in our lot. If you have a lumper fee, you have three hours from the time you're unloaded to pay to leave the property. Once you have paid, you have 30 minutes to pick up your paperwork and leave the property. You'll be charged $500. Truckers have it wrong here. I mean, truckers have it hard here, but I want to find out, can you fix truck parking in 60 seconds or less? Yes, already doing it. We already doing it. So you just talked about you know, your former guests. Okay. Um, I've been working on middleware software and marketplace software, and we've stood up. It, think of the, if you could imagine the U-Haul business, the whole marketplace and to be able to do everything long-term, short-term build direct to the fleets. Yes. So part of the problem is, and this is where, a very small piece of the parking storage. We always look at it like, I don't know if you know this, if we produce 60,000 trailers a month in the industry and I was buying 400 trailers a year, I gotta get those trailers in my network. We can move them and that's the relay. That's what JD comes in and talks about. That's what the repower guys are doing. But the real money is why don't we ask ourselves, why does a billion dollar transportation company except 20% empty miles within the supply chain. Because and, uh -oh. it's, uh -oh, that was it's, integrated, it's a routing and optimization process where the big dollars is. And so, yes, it, we are actually developing, and they are developed, the solutions to solve those problems. Very cool. Now, one more thing for you. This is a tech thing. This is a brave new world. My friend Chris Thomas was just at a conference and he saw a remote control truck. And I'm talking about an actual semi. Roll this tape. Remote control truck driving in Las Vegas. The truck was in Fort Worth. What do you think of this remote driving tech? Uh, it's been doing great things. Um, you know, one of my friends in the industry who uh, has scaled and sold several products, he's been working in this area and there are many applications this happens the analogy that i will use is this um so one of the challenges for a technology partner or even a consumer of technology is sometimes you have to rebuild the jet you're flying in and so i use a different analogy and i say i want to build the super highway of the optimal solution but i want to build the super highway while i'm running down the frontage road and I build the exit ramp and the entry ramp to get on and off these new technologies. Do you know how you build a, a, an interstate system? You engineer the intersections first, the crosswalks. You engineer the bridge abutment to an eighth of an inch of tolerance. So when you understand where the actual connectedness happens, and then you study that and say, how do I root cause and de-risk that? I can control the environment of the application. And then what I can do once I get those critical points, then I can lay a super highway. And if you flew in a helicopter, do you know your interstate wanders 10, eight, 10 feet back and back? Same thing with autonomy. Autonomy is trying to find the super perfect design of experiments. Elon Musk, is not an autonomous driving company. He is a data collection and analytics company gathering all the behavioral data, but he has trillions of data points sitting out there. And so as we inform how we break things and whatever, what I think will happen is there's automated, like a DC to DC uh, at Anheuser-Busch. It's a remote control or back in 1980. I forget the year, uh, the Koch brothers up in uh, Michigan, they have a smelting plant 
We built an autonomous truck and a vehicle that can drive underneath the tailing and the slag coming out of a smelting plant. And it drove it five miles down a road and it dumped it into a settling pond that went into a landfill. Those closed loop applications are all over us. We have automated warehouses with automated loading. And so we're slowly bringing autonomy in. And the key is we engineer and control the risk where it really happens. So if Jim, we drive Jim, off sorry, the road, Jim, we gotta, I Jim we're, we're running out of time. I got I to gotta land the plane. I got 30 seconds left. How, do, right, people reach, how do people reach out to you? How do they find you? That's the risk. Anytime. Um, Jim at TechCacity, T-E-C-H. G-A-C-I-T-Y dot com. Jim, I'll have you back on. We got more time. Take care, brother. By the way, State of Freight webinar coming up at See Your Jim. State of Freight webinar coming up at 2 p.m. today. Go to FreightWaves.com to register for that. Maybe on demand afterwards. Speaking of on demand, you want to find this show uh, after the fact, go on any podcast player, look up What the Truck, go to FreightWaves YouTube channel, get an entire playlist of every single one of these episodes. On video, you can find me on Twitter at Timothy Dooner or LinkedIn or find the show at FW What the Truck, TikTok, Twitter, all those kind of things. Hey, take care. Don't be a stranger and see you Friday.